Tonight on our front, we continue with our sharp focus on the intense debate surrounding Ghana's decision to grant a lease to that firm for lithium production. My guest is Imani Africa's Vice President Bryce Simmons. I mean, we will deal into the most important, the key aspects of the controversial deal, aiming to shed light on the critical issues that have stirred widespread discussion on this. You're welcome, sir. I hope you are doing well today. Thank you very much. And I'm Thank grateful you. that you're able to join us today. I want us to Bye. start from the top. I want us to start from why there's so much talk about lithiums now. Of course, we had on the battery conversation, we had on the electric vehicle conversations, but why is lithium such a big deal for a conversation to be had on that? No, you're absolutely right. Um, lithium represents one of the most important enablers of the shift from the traditional economy to the new greener economy. Uh, it's been called white gold for that reason. That is why we worry that the degree of imagination, the degree of innovative thinking that has characterized policy making um, so far on this topic constitute a failure of imagination. This mineral was discovered maybe 200 years ago, mm. roughly, around 1817. And in the subsequent decades, it was primarily used for medical purposes, uh, particularly to manage um, psychiatric and psychological conditions like mania, and then over time, its use in ceramics and other more industrial applications became apparent. What is interesting, though, is that over the last couple of years, it became clear that because it's such a light metal and because it's such a good conductor of electricity, if you talk about batteries that go into not just vehicles, but storage, power storage applications, like you have a windmill or you have a solar panel and you need to store the power up because this is intermittent, the battery that you use inevitably has lithium in it. There are other minerals that compete with lithium, other minerals that compete with lithium. But lithium is one of the most popular. Okay. And that is evident in the fact that analysts believe that between now and 2050, we're going to see a situation where of all the minerals that are often quite um, important in this green transition, so you can see some of them listed there, cobalt, mm -hmm graphite, uh, indium, vanadium, etc. Lithium will be the one that will see the highest demand in terms of usage, because of its usage okay. for some of these applications. We also know that, as you pointed out from the beginning, this is interesting because in Ghana, we've just given a lease to a company, which gives the company the right, after they get the other approvals, the construction permits, the environmental permits, to begin to produce this lithium and to sell. On the screen, you're looking at a definitive feasibility study that they have conducted. So they've been doing this for a number of years now. Um, and this year, sometime around June, July, they completed a, the definitive feasibility study, which means it's more or less the final analysis before they start to produce. So that final analysis, you see some numbers distributed on the screen. I'm not obviously going to go through them one by one, yeah. but it gives you some idea of how much a mineral that they think is in that mine area. So the mine area itself is something about 42 square, something of the size of about 42 square kilometers. The thing that people have to bear in mind is that this company is not only intending to mine lithium in this particular area, it intends to do so in a much bigger area. It's just that we've given it a permit for now, at least for now, to only that 42 square kilometers. Over time, it hopes to acquire additional licenses that would take it to almost 560 square kilometers. Mm. The other thing to look at there very carefully is the pricing um, of the main output of that mine. And the main output of that mine is something we call spodumen concentrate. Sounds very complicated, but it's straightforward. Spodumen is a kind of mineral, it's a rock. But the, the ore, when you go to the, 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 the location okay. and you see these big rocks, they are generally pegmatites. Mm. Now, the pegmatite is crushed and you separate out the spodumen. The spodumen is that thing that has a lot more lithium oxide than the rest of the uh, um, items or the rest of the, okay. the minerals that are in that rock. 6% spodumen concentrate simply means that when you take that rock and you separate out other stuff, we get 6% lithium oxide content. So essentially what you want is the lithium oxide. But the lithium oxide is in a rock, which is in another rock, etc., etc. So you are breaking it down to you get the rock that has a lot of lithium oxide. So concentrating simply means you get more spodumen 
And the spodumen that you get, if you get about 75% of spodumen in the rock, as opposed to the other types of things that form the pegmatite, then you are likely to get 6% lithium oxide, which is what you are really looking for. Mm. So that is basically the economics. And the pricing that they are hoping to sell this for is about, when they did this study, was, was around $1,695. Uh, that has obviously now changed. And we, its current market price is just a little above 1200 1300 thereabout. So those are the economics. Other important points to bear in mind about this whole lithium rage is that right now as we speak, lithium is not a big econo deal economically yet. It's the, okay. it, these are early days. Okay. So Zimbabwe, the largest producer of lithium in Africa, makes about $250 million from lithium. Primarily because they made mistakes early on and didn't insist on a lot of local refining. So we make $6.6 .6 billion from gold annually. Mm. They make $250 million from lithium. That's very important to keep bear in mind. So the reason why the focus on value addition is so intense is that if you don't have a focus on value addition, we are talking of a mineral that will make us less than $200 million a year, which is far less than oil or gold or any of these minerals. So it will not be a game changer unless we focus on value addition. The other thing, the good thing about lithium, though, is that refinement, early refinement increases the value much quicker than okay. some of the other things. I'll give you an example. If you have cocoa beans and you turn cocoa beans into powder or liquor or butter, the improvement in the value that comes to you is not very significant. In fact, in some instances, you actually lose money by doing that. Oh, I see. However, if you turn it into chocolate, then it goes way up. So people have argued that the global chocolate market is about $100 billion. The global cocoa market is much less. The difference with lithium, though, is that just by getting to the stage where you have lithium carbonate that goes into the battery, you can already capture a third of the battery price. So it's a very different, it's not like butter, uh, cocoa butter or cocoa powder, where cocoa butter and cocoa powder doesn't give you as much of the value of chocolate. This is a bit different. So it makes va uh, value addition much more profitable. I guess the last point in trying to explain where we are going is that lithium alone will not give you a battery. And the battery is the, it's almost like the ultimate price. Getting the batteries made in your country is what really will transform your society. But you need other things to make the battery. You need cobalt, you need manganese, phosphate, etc., etc. So in looking at this, you also have to be paying attention to the value chain, not just from the lithium on was, but complementary. So think of it as a value web. Okay. What are the other minerals coming into it? Thank you. So that's the point I was making about the precursors. What you are looking on the screen now is kind of like a rough value chain for the lithium itself. Starting with the raw material, okay. we get it from spodumen. spodumen. Some people get it from brine, which means that they get seawater or some so, salty water, yeah, dry it, and get the lithium out. It's a very, very useful approach as well. Lipidolite, we have some lipidolite um, occurrence in Ghana, but that's not what this mine is about. So we get spod, uh, spodumen. Our goal is to process it into one of, some of these types of outputs. Yeah. Now, which one is interesting? So if you think gold, you refine gold, you still get gold yeah. because you're only you're improving the purity. Yeah. This is different because there are multiple things you could make. Lithium carbonate, lithium hydroxide, hydroxide, and chloride. Lithium chloride. Okay. So the question is, which one are we focusing on, etc.? The point, though, is that if you look at it, you know, you don't just move from lithium carbonate to whatever to start to do the components of uh, the battery or make the components okay. of the battery. There are some other things you need to do, and that is where you need the other minerals to come in. So if you look here, you say, this, what are the lithium precursors? What are the ion precursors? What are the phosphate precursors? The lithium ion phosphate is a type of battery. For each of the metals that you are, uh, minerals that you are using in that battery, you need some other substances that help. And so it's very important that we bear in mind that we can't just take the lithium and then get batteries. We need some other things added to it. And then lastly, you get your battery uh, cell. The battery cells get combined into the pack, which you put in the car. And then you are able to get your consumer electronics, like make a car or make a, mm. a, a, a what do you call it, uh, energy storage systems. So this more or less says the same thing. The important point to note is that some of these minerals that you need in order to be able to turn the lithium into a battery, like graphite, we've also discovered that in Ghana. Last okay. year, we discovered graphite in Kambule. And in Kambule, we have the graphite. It was also discovered very similar to the way this one was discovered. There's no focus on it. Mm. But if you remember when I showed you the chart of which minerals are going to see the biggest demand going That's for true. graphite was number two or three, yeah. you see. So now we have graphite there. The question is, are we being strategic in understanding that graphite is another component in our yes, journey towards getting to batteries? Okay.
And are we thinking like that? Because so far, we are all focused on lithium. lithium. Nobody's talking about the graphite find. And whether there's some issues that we are raising in this lithium agreement, some of that might be found in the graphite agreement as well. Mm -hmm. Now, I came to this because it's important. Mm -hmm. And just yesterday, I was in a conversation with Dan McConvey, yes, who had stated that this conversation that happened in the Republic of Ghana may be much ado about nothing because in the next 10 years, if we don't act quick and fast, in the next 10 years, lithium may be like sand. But you have raised, of course, with other CSOs, have raised very serious issues about this deal. So the question remains, why are you opposed to the current deal that has been tagged as one of the best on the continent, or even if it's the whole world? So the issue is, in fact, it's partly the reason that we don't know what is going to happen which makes it so important that we get agreement right. And the challenge that we have with this agreement starts with the way it's been framed. It's been framed as the best agreement we've ever had in mining. All of the focus has been in praising the agreement rather than answering some very important questions about how we make sure we're getting the best value out of this mineral. Here are the main financial terms which are being presented as extremely important. So the royalties, this is when you go to the agreement, yeah. this is how the royalties is framed. And we are supposed to get 10%. Royalty simply means when you sell the lithium, whatever money you get, yeah. we take our 10%. It doesn't matter whether you make profit or you don't make profit. Mm -hmm. We take it from the overall yeah. sales. Then there are other financial obligations which require them to pay 1% of revenue as a tax. They have to pay and uh, give the government 13% stake in the local company that they have set up to own the asset, to own the, the, the mining lease, which is the, the mine in essence. So all of that come together to create the the picture that has been painted, that is the best deal we've ever had. The truth of the matter, though, is that we know historically, factually, that that cannot be true. Because our, in our own history, we've had mining agreements where the state owns far more, where the share, relative share of the Ghanaian people was far more than we are talking about here. And a very good example is when you go into the 70s, you find out that you know, we had in the Champon regime, a mining decree was created and as a consequence of that mining decree, 55% of every mining asset in this country, minimum, was owned by the government. In fact, most of the gold mines, in actual fact, most of the gold mines were owned by the states. Okay. Except in the likes of Ashanti Goldfields and a couple of others. On top of that, some people say, okay, well, but that was a nationalization period. They were nationalizing. The truth is they were not entirely just nationalizing because they were signing service contracts that made those companies essentially contractors of Ghana. So Ashanti Gold, for instance, was now a contractor. We had a contract with them that allowed them to mine and give us some of the, uh, and, and take some of the money and give the rest to us, right? But we own the asset and we hide them. So that is an important point to note. But, and before then, in 1969, we had already gone into a negotiation with Ashanti Gold and acquired 20%. This was without nationalization. And we had an option to buy an additional 20%. So it's not possible that a 13% share is the highest we've ever done in our history. It's just not historically possible. Mm. Even in the 80s, when we decided that because of mismanagement, this idea where we have to have the majority, this idea where we have to have about 50%, was no longer viable because we had mismanaged the sector to the point where we didn't have investment coming in, okay. we didn't have technology, so we changed our mind in the late 80s. Even then, we had a joint venture strategy that enabled us, for instance, in the Konongo Mine Project and others, to be able to get as much as 30%. So historically, it's not been the case that in the case the 10 is world, the highest, yeah. uh, the 10, or the 13% equity stake is the highest. We also had a variable royalty mechanism that allowed us to get up to 12% depending on the economics of the project, if the economics improve. So which year was that, the variable period? Uh, 87 was when the law was passed. Okay, all right. So that then brings us to specific issues with agreement. Like I said, this running around, jumping and dancing, that is a great deal doesn't address the specific challenges that CSS have raised. And they should focus their minds on answering those specific issues. So for instance, we've said that when you look in the agreement, they say the company shall pay to the government a royalty of 10% of the total revenue earned from the sale of the minerals obtained from the lease area. The concern we have is that this is a bit vague because this makes it subject to the company's ability to cut deals because they have to go and sell it. So they sign a deal for someone to buy it. Why is this a problem? Lithium, unlike gold, unlike aluminum or bauxite, unlike oil and gas, it's not as widely traded. Mm -hmm. So it's not like gold and the rest where, you know, we have massive global markets. It's still okay. a very new market 
and very few people trade it. In fact, the Chinese are so dominant that whatever they do in their country shapes the global market. Mm. That means, therefore, that a lot of the new small companies that are coming on board and signing these deals to mine lithium, they are doing what we call off-take agreements. They are signing a deal with someone who commits to buy even before they started mining. And then receiving the money up front and using that to invest in developing the mine. So in those circumstances, sometimes those companies have other interest in the way they set the price. This company, for instance, has sold 50, this Atlantic Lithium, for instance, has sold 50% of the mineral in advance to a company called Piedmont. Piedmont is a US company that is also trying to get lithium to refine, to put into um, lithium carbonate and others and sell to Tesla. So Tesla can make cars. Okay. Now the challenge is that because this company didn't have money, um, this company, Piedmont, paid about $17 million upfront to finance most of the things that were done to allow the company to get to the stage where they've got in. Now, even though the offtake agreement suggests that it's a market-based pricing mechanism, we don't understand what that means. So it's, there's nothing that should, because we haven't seen the offtake agreement, that shows that that pricing is the best that could have been attained. So the argument that we are making is that in the agreement, it should be very clear that there is a pricing benchmark which is independent of the company's individual transactions which determines the value of the revenue. Because our royalties is 10% of the value of the revenues. Mm. So if the company has other interests, maybe because um, this Piedmont company wants to do what they did for them in Ghana, in Ivory Coast. Remember that the company also has an application pending in Ivory Coast to mine lithium. If the company decides to finance that project, then the company might argue that, oh, because we are a strategic investor, we want you to give us a discount on the pricing. They can renew the agreement, the offtake agreement at any point. Okay. That will affect the economics of the project for us because we are waiting for the sales to take our, team, our 10%. So important that like India has done, where in India, the pricing is set to a global benchmark, the London Mercantile Exchange rates. So essentially, you can go and do your deals, but when it comes to us calculating how much the thing that you produce, it should be valued for us to take our 10%. We would take our 10% based on a, a global benchmark, which is independent of whatever transactions that you make. So this is one of the suggestions that we've made to improve. And I'm happy to hear your views as we go on, what you think of that particular approach. So that is one of the approaches we've taken. The other approaches that we are recommending is based on... The other approaches that we have, we are, we have recommended is called the real options approach. Okay. And it simply says that because things are changing so fast in the lithium market, like you said a moment ago, mm. we need flexibility. We need the right to do things without obligations. That is what we call real options in finance. And we need to introduce some of them in based on some of these factors that are already apparent. One of the factors that is apparent is that lithium is being competed against or has seen competition from other technologies in the battery space. So we have technologies such as sodium ion, which is already commercially viable because some Chinese companies have successfully used it in electronic, electric buses and things like that. The Americans gave a lot of money to NASA to look for new energy forms for their space applications and the like. And NASA has already been able to do a breakthrough in selenium. All of these competing uh, technologies mean that at the time it comes, you rightly pointed out where lithium is not very competitive. Same with the fact that now you can recycle the old battery into a new form and then use the lithium again from the old battery. All of that will affect demand. And because they will affect demand, uh, just as we saw recently, prices can really fluctuate. Last year in November, yeah. we saw the highest prices lithium has seen so far since it started being mined. It went to 8 to 1,000 tons in lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide form. So in lithium hydroxide form, lithium was selling for about 8 to 1,000. Today, it's selling for roughly 16,500. So that's a massive fall. But the hope is that it's going up again. Uh, yes, but you don't know the dynamics. Okay. So all of those things mean that you need to have options embedded in the agreement that says that when things improve, like the way that it came down to 16.5, if it now goes to 200,000, you don't want to be locked into a static arrangement, which includes the ownership. So the equity itself must be tied to the economics of the project. I'll give you an example. In the project, when you saw the definitive study that I showed you, they expect that they will recoup the amount of money they invested in the plant within five months. Five months. If you think of the whole capacity of the project throughout the life of the mine, it's about less than $200 million. That is not a lot of money. But the project is expected to generate more than $2 billion, depending on some of the economies that I'm talking about. In those circumstances, 
you want a situation where at some point you can increase your equity because they've already recouped their investment, made a huge amount of returns. And in those circumstances, it makes sense that us as Ghanaians, because we've such great hosts, are able to dial up. Those types of things require the use of options to achieve that. And the same with the, the, the royalty structure. And as I've explained to you, that royalty structure where when the uh, situation of the market improves, we get more money. We've tried it already. We already had laws in 87, all the way in 87, where you could have variable rates that would move all the way to 12%. Everybody in the industry knows it, called sliding scale. The problem has been the way we enforce it, which is why we are saying that you need improvement. The, in the, the, way you the only, only difficulty that um, somebody like Inis Afuseni has with that is that mm -hmm. the companies have not been very truthful mm -hmm. with their declarations. Which is why you must have your bottom floor. Okay. So the 10% is a bottom floor. Okay. Anything above that goes up. But part of it is also where you peg it, where you peg the decision of how you charge that when for prior, uh, tax. Okay. What we are saying is that you cannot do it in general taxation because other minerals don't behave like that. Mm. So you need to do it either for a specific green mineral uh, law or mineral by mineral, like lithium oh, and things like that. Oh. So that dynamic is important. The other thing, reason also why we have to be careful, and now I'm going into the second half of the conversation, which is around, uh, which everybody forgets. It's not only that we are giving a lease to this company to come and mine lithium and give us a share. What is important to recognize is that we are also investing in the company. Ghana. Yes. Through Myth. the MIIF. Which is a sovereign the, fund. Yes, the Mineral Investment Fund exactly. that we put together as a country. Exactly. Okay. So they've come to our country, they found minerals. Um, they use the minerals to get the money to do the mining, as I explained to you. Okay. Now they have the, the minerals and they're about to go around and mine it. But on top of that, we are also going to put money into the company. You get the point. So it's important that we, 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 we separate them, but we connect them. Yeah. Because these two transactions are intertwined. And we get value for both. Now, in doing so, we have to recognize that this is a fairly weak company. Their last funds uh, money that they raised was about $13.2 million on the stock market. And as I've explained to you, for the $17 million, they could not raise it. And they don't want to take debt. So they got to go to the customer, end customer, mm -hmm. let their customer pay in advance for them to develop their mind and give the customer equity. Okay. So the customer, for instance, has got 22% uh, from the investment that they are making uh, in the mine based on a certain implied valuation. You get the point. So the customer has given you some money up front to get a share of the resource. And that share of the resource puts a valuation now on the mine. Okay. Uh -huh. So some of the challenge we have is that this company, for instance, before it had all the permits that it needed, including the current permit that it had, had already put out a statement in order to raise this $13.2 million that it had all the permits required in Ghana to go into production, which was not true. Before it had the permits. Before it had the permits. So it tells you that it's quite desperate to raise money, right? Now, when you, have, you see things like that, it tells us that we have to be careful. We don't tie the national strategy of our country to the business challenges and business opportunities and issues of a company. We just have a national lithium strategy that this company then has to play within. Because a lot of the things that are being driven is because the company has to do things in a certain way, given the fact they cannot raise money. So they are leading the way. They are leading the way. Uh, and like I was saying that, you know, you compare this company to, say, Newmont, which is almost $50 billion. Mm -hmm. This company's total market cap is less than $160 million at this point. So it's a, a small company. It's a startup company. And the way that startups typically operate is that they have to make compromises in order to raise resources. And one of the arguments that we've made is you have to be careful in doing that because otherwise, then you become subject to a highly risky approach because startups are more risky than you as a sovereign. Okay. And that is where we have a challenge with the way that MIF is proceeding with the investment plans that he has. I.e. the way our money, which is in the investment fund, the that gold, we have The set gold up. money that we make, yes. almost all of it, the gold money that we make, yeah. most of it has gone into a fund yeah. to look for opportunities, mm -hmm. to grow it for us. So this is money that ordinary will have gone to schools and other things. We say, no, we want to invest it for the future. The point is that, are we going to make our money back? So if they decide to invest that money into this company... Uh, sorry, we are talking about, about the myth of um, Ejapa fame. Uh, yes, Ejapa was not myth. Myth was a Ghanaian yeah. entity. Mm -hmm. But myth was going to be the conduit yeah. through which money will pass through into Ejapa. Ejapa. Okay. We decided that we're not going to allow Ejapa. Mm -hmm. So the money now sits in myth. Okay. So rather than do Ejapa, we have the money in myth. And myth is now having to invest. So myth has decided to put... Uh, make an investment in this uh, um, uh, uh, opportunity, okay. this lithium opportunity. Mm. And that investment, it comes with a price tag, $32.9 million. It wants to get 6% in the local company, 
3% in the parent company. So the argument we are making is threefold. One, is the money they are paying valid? The amount that they say they need to pay, is that how much they really have to pay to get it? Number two, based on the valuation of the mine, it gives them a sense of the likely returns in the future because of the cash flow, right? Now, we have a concern with how they've done that computation. And number three, we have a history where we make investment in some of these mines, and over time, because we don't have money to further invest or to do follow-on investment, the share that we have, the stake that we bought, dilutes dramatically. And I'll show that in a minute if you, you give me a chance. So what you are seeing here, as I've tried to explain, is that MIF is trying to convince us that this is one of the greatest deals this country can ever get. That already they've logged in again. So if you read their press statement, they say yeah. they've logged in again on over yeah. 31%. And we are trying to prove that that cannot make sense because one way you can look at it is say, this whole year, how much has the stock appreciated and depreciated? The highest point that the share price reached was about $0.41, 41 cents in January of this year, 20, January 27th. At the time that they bought, they said they got, a, they, they got a price of $0.26. Cents. And then it went up to $0.34. Cents, and they claim that that ex, uh, increase is already a gain. The argument, though, is that today it's at $0.25. Cents. So if you use the same logic that they are using, and you say, how much has this share appreciated or depreciated for the whole year? The share has already lost 40% of its value. So if you use the same analysis that they are using to calculate a gain, that is actually a losing proposition because it has lost 40% of its value this year. Of course, that should not be how we calculate it. We should be calculating its future potential okay. based on pros and cons, like these batteries that are competing with them, this issue about recycling. But that's not how MIP does it. They quickly take one share price at one point, another share price at another point, and then compute a gain. Extract out the difference. And, and say that that's a gain they have made. Yeah. When they have not actually paid for the asset, they have not sold the asset, so they have not realized any gain. When, in fact, if you take a longer span, they've actually lost money. Even since they bought at 26, it's already down to 25. So those are the kind of calculations that we expect have to be made much more effectively. We are talking about a highly volatile stock where it's moved from 41 cents to 34 cents, now at 25 cents. That volatility implies risk. Yeah. And elementary finance says that you don't calculate returns, how much you are making, unless you take into account the risk involved. So we call it risk adjustment or risk adjusted returns. Now you cannot have a situation where you make those kinds of elementary mistakes without expecting that people like us will call you out because the gains they claim they have made is not made. What does that mean? It means in principle, MIF is yet to justify why they even want to invest in that, in that find. Then we come to valuing the actual mine, the mine that has a Oya a a a itself. Mm -hmm. And then there, they give us some numbers. At one, in one of their press releases on their website, they claim it's worth 1.4 billion. They don't tell you how they come to that number. Then the most recent one, they claim that because someone, uh, some investors who are already in the, in the fine tried to now buy the whole thing, and they made some proposals, we should use that share, 42 cents, to calculate, and then that, that gives us $691 million. Now, none of these hold water because just by looking at the two numbers, it's clear that it's highly incoherent. That's, there's a huge difference. Exactly. Two. So either it's drop in value, which is concerning, or these are all arbitrary. There's no real support behind them. We say, okay, what is the actual investment that have come in tied to some equity that we can use? Because this one, they didn't accept. This offer that was made for 42 cents that they used to calculate this one, it wasn't accepted. We know Piedmont has made investment in the firm, and based on a certain investment that they intend to make over time, they intend to get 22.5%, and then over time get another 27.5%. We can use those percentages and how much they paid to compute a certain potential valuation. And when you do that, it's far lower than what they are saying, perhaps maybe one third of what they are saying. So it gives you worry. So one third, third of, of the 1.4 billion or the six of the 690 now. Okay. If you look right. at that implied uh, okay. math. So that is of worry to us. So you come to a situation where you have to say, how should they approach it? They have talked a lot about intrinsic value because they know that the market changes. Mm -hmm. So they are trying to find out what is the real value independent of the price movements. One of the ways you normally do is, is to look at the discounted rate of your cash flows in the future. You say, how much money am I going to be making from this thing? And how much is that money worth today? Yeah. It's a very common technique. Now, when you use that, you have to remember that in this particular case, though, the cash flows are very volatile because their mineral is very volatile in its pricing, as I've shown you. You also have to remember that it doesn't have historic cash flow. 
Because this is a company that is new. It's a startup. So it's almost like you are valuing a startup. If you do that, typically, you have to give yourself a margin of safety, which links to that historic volatility. And that margin of safety, if you apply it to the analysis that they've done, using the definitive feasibility study, because in the study, they project forward how much they are going to earn. Yeah. So you can use that as some kind of rough cash flow analysis. But when you apply a good margin of safety based on the volatility, you get far less than the intrinsic value that they have come up with. And I've already proven to you that some other investors, like Pedmont, the off-taker, has made investment at a lower valuation than they are. So that is reinforced by that. What is the point we are making? The point we are making is that they should do better at justifying it with such analysis by showing us the numbers, by giving us their projections. We think lithium will beat sodium ion because of so-and-so, and because of all of those calculations, we forecast this, this uh, cash flow stream or some other uh, stream of benefits, economic benefits, better than other people are doing. And therefore, we think 26 cents is a good price to pay. But it should not be on the basis of expecting people to just praise them because they are throwing some numbers around based on a 15-day or so uh, share price movement. That cannot be a valuation me me mechanism. The other thing that we also want to see is that they want to buy more. So that this is really 26, which they are trying to lock in and collect. They want to spend 36 cents to buy more of the stake later on, if things improve. That's a smart idea generally, because that's what we're asking the government to, to do, not only MIF. The government should also have options to buy more. The problem with that model is that they, are not to, they, they keep saying intrinsic value, intrinsic value, without showing us how they arrive at intrinsic value. So far, not a single paper. Nothing that gives them a sense of how they are thinking about this valuation. There are no details on it. There are no details around it. And when you look at the practice, the practice is often for warrants, which is a, a kind of option, is to use the Blasco's valuation model, where you have all these, these inputs. And our argument would be that for this particular one, they need to prioritize volatility. You need to prioritize volatility because the share price and the economics of the project, the, the cash flow, yeah. will be highly volatile. So for those reasons and that, those factors, we are not confident in the way in which um, they have gone about doing the agreement. It comes to a third point, which I think is very critical. And that is that, okay, even if they got a good price and they get a certain share, they say they want 3% in the global company with one board seat. Okay, we used to have, 60, uh, we used to have 55% Ashanti Gold. Then Ashanti Gold went international. If you think of this company, for instance, their only asset today is Ghana. They have never produced revenue, serious revenue before. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes, because it's a very small company. Mm. In 2020, 2014, before they went to the stock market, and they are not even on the main stock market, they are on the subsidiary stock market, the, the sub-market. Mm -hmm. When they went there, before, in that year, they had, the total amount of money they had in their bank account was less than $30,000. So it's a very small company, as you understand me. Now, most of their fundraising is therefore ahead of them. So even if you get 3%, just as when Ashanti Gold was a, primarily a Ghanaian company, because this was where they had all their assets, we owned 55%. And then in time, as they internationalized, and as they were expanding, and they were going to Tanzania, and they were doing all of these things, more investors started piling in money. And as the investors piled in money, their valuation went through the roof, and they could raise money at higher valuation. Ghana did not have the money to keep investing, because every time they do a fundraise, if you don't in invest with them, you lose your, yes. your stake. Your valuation is called dilution. Mm -hmm. So we are arguing that, we don't want a situation like Ashanti where we move from 55% to 35% to eventually 16.8% and now 0.04%. This is Ghana stake now because of dilution. So we want a mechanism in the agreement. And this is well known. There are mechanisms that you use for anti-dilution. MIF says, oh, we have the right of first refusal when they want to raise money at certain junctures and the rest of it. That depends on whether Ghana has the money to match the market valuation. Okay. And which historically we've not had, which is why in our gold mining companies where we had strategic assets, golden share, if you remember, mm -hmm. we lost all of those privileges. And now we have 0.04%. So the same thing will happen to us unless we have strong anti-dilution provisions. And MIF should come and explain how they believe that that kind of fear is unwarranted. That is the demand that we are making on them. Thirdly, the company has some credibility issues. I've already given you one hint before. But if you look at their investor presentation... You mean Atlantic Lithium. Atlantic Lithium. Yeah. If you look at their presentation that they made last year to investors, Atlantic Lithium claimed that they have a 10-year tax holiday and that they also have a ball customer... That's more recent. A ball customer tariff from the electricity authorities, which will allow them to spend half what they should normally spend on energy. Whether or not these concessions are true, we need to be told, because they affect our fiscals. Okay. On the tax holiday, it distorts every analysis that has already been made, because it simply means that they will not be paying tax for 10 years. And because tax is about 
30 something percent is a huge component. If, as some of the government officials have said, that's not true, then the company is lying. But it's a regulated company. It's a company that's listed on a stock market, and therefore they cannot just lie to investors. So one of the two is possible. Either they have secret agreements, in which case they'll be getting all these tax breaks, or they are not telling us the truth, in which case their credibility is problematic, and we need to address that. Same way with the kind of situation that we are talking about now with the power situation. We know GCG is almost bankrupt. The only way you give anyone a concession that lets them pay less than other customers, and we know some mines in this country even buy power from the private sector because yeah, they yeah. can't get from, power from the grid. If you are giving them a concession that allows them to pay half, then that money has to be in the form of subsidies because GCG cannot bear any under recovery. So whatever there we are getting from that particular company, what we are giving to them should be netted off so we get the real fiscal terms. And that kind of situation now hasn't, uh, hasn't happened. So that is in regards to MIF. And now there are also other issues in the agreement, but I want to pause to see if you have any questions so far. The other issues in the agreement, such as the tendency to tell the company to do certain things, but with no timelines. So for instance, the company is claiming, we are, we are saying they should list on the stock market. What is the timeline for that? Not stated. Okay. We are saying that they should set up a community development fund and sign agreements with the community to spend 1% of their revenues. No timeline. We need those timelines inserted or at the very least clarified. Same with um, the, one of the biggest issues, refinement. We want them to refine here, as everybody is saying. We don't want to export raw. Uh, Sportiment concentrate is not value added. In that regard, we have this contribution to make, and I'm sure that we'll do that soon. The other point, though, is that Convey told me we should not be concerned about a refinery anytime soon or building one anytime soon because it's not a very profitable venture to go into. We'll take a break. After a break, continue our conversation on our front. You welcome back to our front. My guest tonight is Bryce Simmons, and I'm sure some of you followed his presentation on Saturday and know that there's marked difference between uh, the part he did there and the extensions, for example, the conversations about the MIIF and this company proper that's been given the lease or there is resigned, government's already signed the lease with, to be the ones exploiting our lithium and our relations with that company, the investment we want to make into that company, and the very quest that we're actually pursuing. It is all of these convoluted matters around perhaps the biggest conversation in the Republic of Ghana. That's what we are seeking to break down. Joe Kabak said. Thank you so much. Now, so we left off at the point where you said there are other issues yeah. that you, had, you wanted to raise with not just um, uh, the MIF arrangements okay. or the company's credibility itself, but generally about the deal and how far we come with it. Especially in the area of value addition. Yeah. But to wrap up the conversation around why Ghana deserves a better deal in this commercial investment we are making, remember that we are getting a sovereign um, um, share where we don't pay anything and we just get it. Okay. Then we are trying to invest money into the company to get more, but that's a commercial return. It's important that we bear in mind that just as the company did very, um, was very um, concessional when dealing with Piedmont, the off-taker, remember the off-taker that we buy most of the output of the mine, 50% of the output of the mine. It gave them money for them to be able to do this exploration. Just as it was very strategic in terms of the way that you know, it came up to this share valuation for them, we have also done great things for the company. This same company, the time that it came to Ghana, went to Ivory Coast. And when it got to Ivory Coast, it made a similar application to what you know, they made here. In Ghana, we've taken them all the way to a mining lease in record time. In many places, the company, the Piedmont company that I just mentioned, its application is still blocked in North Carolina because people that live around the mine claim that the pollution would destroy their lives and don't allow it. So we've been very, very great, in, uh, very, very generous in expediting this whole process for, for them. These are all benefits because there's time value of money. On top of all of these things, like I've tried to explain so far, when it comes to this uh, bulk power arrangement that they are trying to uh, acquire, when it comes to our willingness for them to do only dense media separation and then do flotation later, what does that mean? What that means is that they are spending far less to get going and some of the more valuable investments that will have made people that are coming to work in that company get more skills. They are deferring it until they can do about 2.5 million tons. That's a concession because some other country will have insisted, no, we want you to use the latest technologies, etc., in the mine from the upfront before they give you the construction permit. We want you to make use synthetic liner in all the ponds before we give you the environmental permit. We are not insisting on all of these things. 
So these are amazing concessions, and they should look at that and do a similar deal with us like they've done with Piedmont, okay. where the valuation is not as high as MIF is charging. The other big thing that we have a challenge with is the value addition strategy. The country has to have a value addition strategy. And as I've tried to explain, lithium is not a simple mineral like gold, where you just keep refining it and getting uh, uh, more and more purer gold. It has multiple chemistries. It has different things you can use it for. We have to be determined as a country and clear-sighted to say what are those minerals that to us, if we add, or what, what are those chemicals that if we produce out of lithium will make the greatest contribution to us in terms of jobs, in terms of skills growth, in terms of public revenues, etc. And so we look at it and we say, look, this provision in the agreement that simply says the company should go and do um, the company should go and do this thing where we say the company should just go and do a scoping study, and based on the scoping study, it may choose to do a refinery. It's not the most effective way to, 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 to frame the way things should be. We should have clarity in terms of what are the likely elements that will make refining possible, and then agree with the company and put that in the technical schedule to the agreement so that everybody is clear that these are the things that must happen in Ghana before refining can happen. And the company commits to that as well, so that when the scoping study is done, done, before we move into the technical study, before okay. the, the feasibility study, mm. we have all that insight. There was no reason to have gone into this agreement without doing the scoping study first. Because we needed to have that insight to structure the, the terms properly. So that what would have then been required in the agreement was the company to spend money to do a feasibility study, not a scoping study. So there's a huge problem with the agreement that we have. And that requires then that we are now moving into this without any clarity about what the refining itself will mean. And I've tried to explain, in lithium, what you are doing is trying to increase the concentration of lithium oxide generally. That is the primary chemical activity okay. you are doing. So you do various intermediates and end products where the lithium oxide content keeps increasing from the spudumen or from the pegmatite, which you crush, you get the spudumen, from the spudumen till you get lithium chloride or lithium sulfate or some other intermediate, intermediate, then you get to lithium carbonate, then you get to battery grade lithium carbonate until you get to batteries. That concentration of lithium oxide activity Unfortunately for us, that process of concentration all the way to refinement, the price increases are not uniform. You know, the price increases are not uniform. So when you just stop as concentrate, which is where we are, we are here. Okay. We want to go all the way to something like hydroxide, mm. right? But there are many intermediates. So when you say they should refine or they should build a chemical refinery, where is that chemical refinery going to be pegged at? Is it at lithium carbonate? Is it at lithium sulfate monohydrate? We don't know any of that in agreement. So if and I these get are matters you, that must be in technical annexes. If I get you agreement. clear, mm -hmm. the clarity required on the refinery is not in the agreement. It's not in the agreement. As in clarity as to whether or not they will build even the refinery in the first place. That's number one. And number two, what is our value addition strategy? When we look at the market of lithium, what are the things that we want to turn lithium into? What are the uses to we want to put lithium to that will make us the most money, allow us to build chemists or grow chemists or do yeah. all of these things that are valuable? We first have to decide that. And the green mineral policy, nobody has seen. Mm -hmm. On top of that, you have to then be base the agreement on that national value added strategy. To base the agreement on national value added strategy will have meant that in that agreement, there will have been an annex to the agreement that suggests that of their things that are possible, these are the ones that are in alignment Mm. with Ghana's value addition strategy. Which will determine the kind of refinery you have to build, have to the build and all of that. Yeah. So, uh, and as I've said, they should have done the scoping study first mm -hmm. to already determine some of these things. And then when you are doing the feasibility study, it's only to find out what are the things that will have to happen for this to be profitable. And what is the level of profitability that if we are able to reach, then the decision is a go. The go, no go investment decision will then be based on that feasibility study. We've done things upside down where we are now saying they should go and do a, a, a scoping study, but we've already signed an agreement with them. This is not the time to do okay. a scoping study. Okay. Because if, unless refinement is not an important part and there are no of terms of the agreement no that says that agreement, after that we do that. the scoping study, we can actually make changes to the agreement. There are well, no, no what I mean like is that, that to the scoping study is simply to give you an overview. Mm -hmm. It's not a technical study. From the scoping study, you go to a technical study, which tries to get real numbers, yeah. hard numbers, and things like that. Then you move on to the feasibility study, which is the one that says, oh, okay, these numbers and the rest, if we do it this way and do it that way, then we make profit. What I'm saying is that in an agreement where if it's indeed our national strategy that we must have refining happening in Ghana, we must already have done the scoping study, understood what potential impediments that might be, 
And the basis of the agreement then will be that these are the things we will do together as parties to make sure the refinement happen. But now we are not going to do the scoping study to even determine if there is a possibility to do refining. So that, what that tells you is that there isn't a prior national commitment to a national strategy that says refining is so important to us that we are willing to make this concept. Let me make but, it but even that's more been practical. highlighted by, Let me make the, it even more by the minister, for example, let me make it even as more one practical. of the key elements of this deal, uh -huh. which makes it a very good deal. So let me make it very practical. Let's suppose that uh, a couple of things are needed for refining to be successful. The amount of lithium that are in the country or available to the country. And whether if we don't have enough lithium, we can import uh, concentrate. Let us say electricity prices. Let us say, because we have to bring a lot of sulfuric acid or some other types of assets, we want to remove the tariffs because we cannot pay the high duty at the port. All of these things in a scoping study will be very clear. So when you are then signed an agreement, you've done that with the clear sightedness about the things that both sides must do in order for the refining to happen. That is not the, it's not, so you don't sign the agreement first, say that go and explore that before we, we talk again. You sign the agreement based on a commitment due to better insight of what it will take to do the refinement, which we both commit to. And that absence in the agreement in the way it's been structured is not very helpful to us. So we say it's been essentially the company's transactional economics are leading the national strategy. And it should be the other way around. Okay. The other thing that we also found uh, interesting, and this is not necessarily related to the agreement, this is a general point, is that the U.S. is obviously very happy about this deal for the reason that China has got most of their lithium supply deals in Africa so far. This is the first time that um, an offtake agreement signed in an African country benefits a U.S. producer. So what are we doing in terms of leveraging that to get more American investment into the other uh, lithium opportunities that okay. exist? This company alone is now been given application rights, prospecting rights, to about 560 kilometers square of our land. None of it was done on tender basis on Knox okay. because they claim that the data doesn't exist. Yeah. And then none of that makes sense. Because the reason why they knew in the first place that there was lithium here was because in 1972, Ghana Geological Service had done an extensive study and identified already measured resources, 1 uh, nearly 1.5 million tons of lithium. The only difference is that it had not been certified by an international body like the Australian uh, Institute of Mining. So when they say something is like has more confidence, it's because there's some international organization based in Australia that has checked the numbers, etc. But it doesn't mean that our geologists didn't know what they were doing because now we know that they knew what they were doing. Because using that data, they came, they found it, and now they're about to mine it. So given that we know similar things are possible, we have a graphite find where the Russians did studies all the way back in 1960. The company used the same data, went to Kambali, and now has graphite. Same thing is happening with this lithium and other concessions. The question is, are we going to change the way we will proceed going forward in how we give them the leases or we are going to maintain the same approach? Unfortunately, I have like a minute or two to wrap up this conversation. Yes. I, I don't know what else you need to prioritize in this conversation that would wrap it up for us. I think that we need to be strategic mm -hmm. in every aspect of this strategy. Okay. And that means, therefore, that rather than the company's own transactional economics, given that the company doesn't have money and it's making all these off-take agreements in order to finance the project, etc., driving everything we do. On the other hand, we should have a national value addition strategy that drives, including a regional value addition strategy. Okay. They are trying to get lithium in Ivory Coast. There's lithium in Mali. There's phosphate in Togo. How do we come together as a sub-region to pull our strengths together and develop a battery supply chain in Ghana? That requires the company to be a component of our strategy, okay. not that we are a component in their global strategy which is what is currently happening. Well, I guess we, can, we should be wrapping up on this point. So, in conclusion, the very last minute of this one will be, when somebody like um, Dan McConvey says, it's a generous deal that Ghana has gotten, is he being factual or not being truthful? No, that's because he's comparing it to other contracts we've signed in the mining space. Mm -hmm. But that is not the right way to look at it. Why? Because those minerals that we've signed those types of contracts with are very established global minerals, been trading for years, they are commoditized. Okay. Lithium is a scarce mineral that is slowly becoming more widely available, but its use could explode. So green minerals are uncertain. And we all know that the greater the uncertainty, the greater the potential reward. Mm -hmm. So we cannot use the strategy we use for gold 
for lithium. So we cannot use contracts that we sign for gold to benchmark contracts we are signing for lithium. We have to use our national strategy on value addition to say because lithium is possible for us to get more out of it than we could get out of gold, what do you use gold for apart from jewelry okay. and a few other applications? Lithiums are being used for batteries, which are the cornerstone of the transformative, digitally driven new economy and green economy. So you cannot use the same principles that apply to gold or even bauxite to apply to lithium because they are different minerals. I'm grateful to you for our time this evening. And Bryce Simmons taking us through what this whole deal is about and unpacking it for us. Hopefully, I'm sure there will be further conversations about it. We are told we'll be going to Parliament and we will be engaging the parliamentarians too on the way forward on this one. Many thanks to you for watching us and many thanks to you, Bright, for the presentation tonight.